Hi, this is Elliot Fisherman, and this lecture is going to be looking at pancreatic cancer, some of the current concepts in lesion detection and staging, and some of the changing thought processes that are going along. Uh, there's no doubt pancreatic cancer remains one of the deadliest malignancies that we do know of. Uh, when you look at all of many other diseases, we see changes in survival, changes in improvement in management from vaccines and on. But uh, pancreatic cancer still is suffering by a lack of a magic bullet. There's no doubt we're doing better. We're having an increased understanding of the fundamental genetics of pancreatic cancer, though we have a long way to go. But one of the important things that we will discuss is that multidisciplinary care. We have a conference today when I'm recording is Tuesday when I finish this lecture. I'm going to go to a multidisciplinary conference, which has surgeons and medical oncologists and surgical oncologists and radiation therapists, pathology, radiology, nursing, and the like. So really, multidisciplinary care is very critical for really giving the best possible treatment for the patient with known or suspected pancreatic cancer. Uh, there's no doubt um, articles, this article by Wolfgang, um, really talks about this multidisciplinary care, and it really is a way of improving. I think for radiologists who are listening to this talk, I think getting involved, whether it's with pancreas or liver or kidney, multidisciplinary conferences are very important to us. It's really in this changing era where surgeons and internists don't come to see us every day like they used to when we had films and controlled all the images. It's a very good way of learning and also showing our value within the patient care environment. So let's look specifically at pancreatic cancer, some of the basic demographics. You see the numbers, 44,000 new cases uh, in a year in the United States. You also see, although it's the 10th most common cancer and 11th in women, 10th in men, the number of deaths, 37,000, makes us the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths in men and women. And this percent is going up as other diseases are coming down. It's a bit more common in uh, African Americans than in white patients. Mean age of diagnosis is 71 years. We typically think about pancreatic cancer as a disease of older patients, but the fact is we see it in a range of patients. Typically, we say 40 to 80, but unfortunately, we've seen some patients in their late uh, 20s. There are a number of risk factors that are spoken about with pancreatic cancer, family history and genetic risk factors. Uh, if you have two or more first degree relatives have pancreatic cancer, then the risk increase at least twofold. We talk about the BRCA2 germline as a possibility. Remember the importance of pancreatic cancer as well as breast cancer, this whole BRCA2. Then there are familiar syndromes, uh, including poots jaegers and Fanconia's anemia, just to name two of them. We speak about environmental factors, tobacco exposure and other carcinogens uh, become very important, certain occupational and job exposures. We've also noticed that patients who develop diabetes, it just seems to be a very close correlation. You get a patient today with pancreatic cancer, and when you look at the history, about three years ago or two years ago, they presented with new onset diabetes. And so that relationship is diabetes development in a patient in their 50s uh, of good sign the patient may develop pancreatic cancer, something that's spoken about, discussed, and we'll see where that goes in the coming years. And also patients with prior pancreatitis and increased alcohol consumption are all potential risk factors. Now, when we talk about treatment for pancreatic cancer, we talk about a changing landscape. The classic thing, the Whipple's procedure, Dr. Cameron at Hopkins has done over 2,000 plus Whipple's procedures, but now we talk also about laparoscopic distal pancreatectomy, and we even talk about laparoscopic Whipple's procedure. We also talk about patients who've been treated uh, and what appears to be successful fibrosis of tumor, we do an on block resection of the celiac axis, the so called Applebee's procedure. We talk about a nucleation, more commonly with neuroendocrine tumors. But there are a lot of surgical options, and part of this is new developments in surgery laparoscopic surgery, using perhaps a da Vinci device as a way of doing surgery, but also the fact that we're getting better in our treatment that patients who are unresectable now resectable, and also in terms of imaging, we give much more information than we ever have in the past. We used to talk about uh, resectable and unresectable. Now we talk about this borderline resectable. And there's a lot of definitions for borderline resectable, but things that were typically considered unresectable, involvement of hepatic artery or celiac, 
involvement of the SMA, short segment occlusion of SMV, portal vein, or their confluence were all things that were considered unresectable. Now they are potentially resectable depending how patients respond to chemotherapy. And again, there's lots of interest in what is borderline resectable. The definition keeps changing, but you can see this article by Springer did make the point that you need high volume centers and you need multidisciplinary approach indeed to pancreatic cancer. Same thing, this article by Wolfgang more recently, these advances provide hope, but they also increase the complexity of caring for patients. It is clear that multidisciplinary care that provides comprehensive and coordinated evaluation and treatment is the most effective way to manage patients with pancreatic cancer. When you look at some of the numbers, and this is an article from our original experience with the multidisciplinary conference, there's another article coming out which has very, very similar numbers and makes the point that almost a quarter of patients who come to see us had a change in their recommend management based on clinical review by the uh, tumor board. And it's interesting, when you look at those numbers, that's a quarter of the patients, right? But when you look, the biggest change was because of radiology. 38 of the 203 were due to radiology. So again, radiology has a major impact. We reinterpret the studies, but probably more importantly, we redo the studies with dual phase imaging and 3D mapping. And a lot has been shown to be the importance of technique. This article by Karen Horton and Pam Johnson spoke about misdiagnosis in looking at the pancreas, either overcalling or undercalling disease, and how important the technique indeed was. And we'll speak about some of the potential misdiagnoses, confusing for peripancreatic masses, for pancreatic masses, a duodenal gist tumor for a pancreatic adenocarcinoma, lymphoma infiltrating, or just nodes in the portal cable space. So there are many, many potential pitfalls. Now, if we start from the beginning and say, okay, what's, how do we do things well? Everything starts with our technique. And again, your technique will vary what scanner you have, but most of you who are listening to this lecture have a 64 slicer better scanner. And so you're able to do isotropic data sets with high spatial and high temporal resolution. Now, there's a lot of interest in how you do studies, and there was a very important article, which I think will be an important template, not just for pancreatic cancer, but I think it will be a starting point for many things we do. This was a group effort, it's a consensus of the Society of Abdominal Radiology and the American Pancreatic Association. The guys in Michigan, uh, Al Hawari and Isaac Francis, uh, did an incredible job leading this approach. And what they wanted to do is say, okay, how should we really be looking and reporting pancreatic cancer? There's so much difference in variability in terms of expertise, also explaining and describing how people report. Perhaps if there was more defined terms and more definable reports, it would help us as we look at ways of improving patient management. And this idea about a more standardized uh, reporting template as it mentions here, potentially will improve and optimize treatment recommendations to our patients. And again, one of the things this article does is not just the reporting, but takes a step back and say, listen, if you want to report things in a very specific, highly formatted way, it's also important the studies are done in a very specific, highly formatted ways. So this article goes through the fact that you need high quality images, you need thin sections, you need multiplanar, you need dual phase imaging, you need 3D imaging to make it work. And if you don't do those studies, it is therefore essential that these patients under go repeat imaging with a dedicated pancreatic CT exam that includes biphasic MDCT angiography. Now I think it's worthwhile reading the article, but let me give you a few highlights. And this is why I think it may be a very good prototype for future things. So for example, in this article, you can see it talks about the scan protocols, very specific from the contrast agents to the acquisition. It talks about what you need to look at it. Again, uh, I know this is small print, but it's not meant to be reading line by line, but showing you we describe how we describe the SMA and celiac and IMA and variations in arterial anatomy and how we look at venous evaluations and how do we quantify that and how we look at extra pancreatic evaluation, how we look beyond the pancreas and vascular structures, and it goes on and on. It has a template for everything. And so it really comes down to more of a structured report.
And in fact, there was a more recent article looking at structured reporting of pancreatic cancer that they found it to be very valuable because when surgeons reviewed reports in combination with multiphasic CT images, they were more likely to convert an answer of unsure to a definitive answer, be it resectable or unresectable, when the reports were structured as opposed to when they were not structured. So again, that goes with some numbers in this article, but you can see the numbers, information for surgical planning were deemed readily accessible in 94% of cases as opposed to 47. So you could see that the numbers indeed become very critical. So there is not just doing the study correctly, but also reporting this study correctly. So this becomes a very important thing. Another thing we noticed at Hopkins a few years back, we often see patients who are referred in and often have outside CTs. And then you kind of notice at times that you have outside CTs for two months ago and then until the patient gets operated on. And you kind of notice that those studies seem to have more error, that the surgeon found more disease than they were expected to find. Well, it became very clear, we know pancreatic cancer is an aggressive disease, and when we looked at our results, we found that if the study was performed within 25 days of the surgery, then it was very accurate, and the longer it went beyond 25 days from time of CT to surgery, you can see the accuracy decreased. And if it's not going two months out, it was particularly poor. So it becomes very, very important to make sure that you have a recent examination. If you're getting a patient who's referred in, if you're getting a patient who, for whatever reason, insurance or just timing, study was done two or three months ago, you better repeat the study before the patient gets surgery because you may find out that the patient is no longer resectable. Even though a patient may not have had metastasis on a scan performed a month before surgery, there's no guarantee that the patient will be free of metastasis at the time of surgery. So that's a very, very good rule. Okay, what about protocols? What are we doing at Hopkins? Well, we, like for many of our patients, always like to distend the stomach and bowel. We give 1,000 cc's of water over about a 15 to 20 minute period. We always give the last cup of water, about 250 cc's, when the patient is on the scanner table. We really want to distend the stomach. One of the great pitfalls in imaging with CT is overcalling or undercalling gastric pathology or proximal bowel pathology. And you avoid this by giving the patient enough oral contrast. No one has ever complained that the patient got too much water and the patient's tolerated very nicely. We always use IV contrast depending on patient size and injection rate, typically 100 to 120 cc's of Omnipeg 350. And if patients have borderline creatinine or other risk factors, Visipeg 320 is what we use. And we try to inject at 5 cc's a second. We never inject at less than 3 cc's. 5 is our magic number, and we try to sit there at 5. But 4 to 5 work very nicely in clinical practice. There's a number of ways of getting the timing. For most patients, 25 to 30 seconds post start of injection is excellent for arterial phase and venous phase at about 60 to 70 seconds post injection. You can also trigger, typically triggering might be done on a 64 slice or better with a trigger point of let's say 200 Hounsfield units over the abdominal aorta, just the level of the diaphragm for arterial phase. Do your arterial phase and come back about 30 seconds later for your portal venous phase. And that works very nicely. I did put up this delayed phase imaging more to remind me to remind you that we essentially never get delayed phase imaging. If there was something you saw perhaps funny in the liver, you might get a delayed phase images. But essentially our protocol and the typical protocol recommended in the radiology article was two phases. But two phases are indeed going to be very critical. We also talk about the role of other modalities. We'll talk about the role of PET-CT. At this point, uh, CT alone is the way to go. Some people are considering the use of PET-CT, particularly in looking perhaps at response based on the uh, vas based on the uptake on PET or change in uptake. It goes from hot to cold. Remember, only about 60 to 75% of pancreatic cancers are actually PET-AVID. But it's something to consider. However, regardless if you're using PET or not, the vascular map becomes very critical and CT angiography really rules the day. Now, in terms of the two phases, the arterial phase is surely the ideal phase for looking at the vascular map.
whether you're looking for normal or variations of anatomy in the celiac and SMA, or you're looking for vessel encasement or collateralization. Venous phase imaging, ideal obviously, for looking at portal vein and SMV and splenic vein. The venous phase is also the ideal phase with adenocarcinoma for looking at liver metastasis. It's also the ideal phase for seeing tumors. Most of the time, pancreatic adenoCA, as we know, is hypovascular, so it's easier seen on venous phase imaging. Obviously, things like neuroendocrine tumors, which we'll discuss separately, are shown better in arterial phase imaging and may only be seen in arterial phase imaging. Remember, neuroendocrine tumors tend to become very vascular, tend to be very vascular, and they become isodense very quickly. If you don't have arterial phase imaging, particularly for smaller lesions, invariably you're going to miss these lesions. Now, one of the things we've always spoken about is how to look at data. And yes, I always look at the axial images, but the fact is the axial images alone are going to limit your information. You really can look at axial imaging alone. If you do that, you're going to be so wrong so often. You need at a minimal to look at the multiplanar, particularly coronal and sagittal. Remember, sagittal is so critical for looking at the SMA and celiac axis. And we routinely do 3D imaging with a combination of volume rendering and MIP, and that works very nicely. Even going back in time, going back almost a decade, the addition of coronal and sagittal MPR increased the sensitivity of CT to agree with surgical findings, or this article by Manns spoke about curative resection successful in 44 or 48 patients when you use multiplanar imaging, or early articles by Rapitopoulos on 3D imaging. Negative predictive value of resectable tumor was 96% with 3D compared to 70% for axial imaging alone, or an article by House from Hopkins, and this is only on 4 or 16 slides you could imagine, but look how good we are, were. 3D CT was 95% accurate in determining cancer invasion of the superior mesenteric vessels, and this was done as a prospective study. And when you looked at the axial images, the accuracy was in the 60 to 70% range. So if we think about looking, what are we looking for with pancreatic mass detection? Well, we look for size. Remember in the old days, average mass was four or five centimeters. Now we're trying to pick a masses that are a centimeter or two. We're not just looking at size, we're looking at enhancement changes. And typically with adenocarcinoma, it's decreased enhancement. Neuroendocrine tumor, increased enhancement. We look for duct transition. If you see a pancreatic duct that's dilated, you better figure out why. You see a transition point in the pancreatic duct, even if you don't see a mass, I'm suspicious there's a cancer there. You see common duct dilatation. Why is it dilated? It could be anywhere from a stone in the common duct to a pancreatic cancer to a distal common duct cancer to an ampullary cancer. So duct dilatation becomes very important. And then looking at adjacent structures. So let's look at some of the things we speak about. I mentioned about pancreatic cancer. We tend to think of it being a solid mass, lower density, hypovascular. You can see cystic components. Sometimes it relates to pancreatitis with a carcinoma, but sometimes tumors are very necrotic. But here's a very typical example of a mass in the pancreatic head, very nicely shown here and here. And you can see very nicely it's hypodense. It abuts the patient's uh, SMV and SMA, but there's no invasion. You can see it very nicely on the coronal view with a 3D volume rendering. You can see when I speak about volume rendering, how we can accentuate the tumor, comparing that to the duodenum. You can see the mass abuts the vessel, but there's no vascular involvement. And you can see it here again, image on your left is volume rendering, image on your right is with MIP. Very, very nicely shown. Or in this case, you see a dilated pancreatic duct. You don't see a large mass, but when you look in the body of the pancreas very carefully, you see the hypodense lesion right there. That's a classic pancreatic carcinoma. You can imagine in the old days you would miss these because there's no mass effect, and unless you perceive the changes in duct caliber, unless you saw the subtle enhancement changes, easy to miss. We talk about this, often patients present with abdominal pain in the ER and they get non-contrast scans and the lesion is missed because you don't have that transition between normal enhancing gland and the tumor. We talk about transitions, look at this example. You very nicely see a dilated pancreatic duct in the distal body and tail, then you see abrupt cutoff in the mid-body. 
You also notice that the head and body of the pancreas enhance normally and the distal gland has decreased enhancement. That's a very classic sign of atrophy, decreased enhancement, duct cutoff. There's a pancreatic cancer there. Now if you tell me you don't see the pancreatic cancer and every once in a while it may be hard to see, you have to assume there's a pancreatic cancer and then do EUS. Dr. Cameron would say perhaps you should just operate on the patient, but you can see very nicely here when you look hard, there's a subtle mass present, but it's subtle, but you're always going to see a mass present when you have that ductal transition. And here's just another example showing the ducts dilated, but look at the transition between the normal head into neck and the, and the body into tail, the decreased enhancement, very nicely shown as I put the arrows present. So again, this is a very good sign. Now it's a small tumor. Now the smaller the tumor, the more likely you will be resectable. You're not always gonna be resectable, obviously with a small tumor, but there's no doubt the earlier we detect things, the more likely we are to be in a curative state. Well, look at this example. Look at the distal body and tail, how atrophic they are. You can see very subtle duct dilatation. And then look proximal to that. You see this changes in caliber. You see that lesion right there? Very, very nicely shown. Pancreatic adenocarcinoma, very nicely defined. And here's just a couple more images. So again, you can see it's very subtle. It's much easier to see on the coronal view than it was on the axial. Now, people do speak about what they would call isoattenuating pancreatic adenocarcinomas, where they say, well, the lesion is really small, and perhaps you just don't see a lesion. Uh, people have spoken that it may be 5% of cases have these isoattenuating lesions. I have to admit, I think it's much smaller than that, but invariably with these isointense lesions, you always see a dilated duct, you always see a transition, and truthfully, if you look hard enough, you almost always will see the mass present. But as I mentioned, if you don't see the mass, you have to treat the patient as if there's a mass present. Now, we mentioned duct dilatation, and I showed you some pancreatic duct dilatation. Again, we talk about a duct more than three millimeters typically being dilated in the pancreatic duct, but it's kind of relative different parts of the gland. If there's a transition between different parts of the gland, you really have to understand what's going on. Now, it's also important to look at the common duct, and patients present with jaundice when there's common duct obstruction. Here's a very nice example of a dilated common duct. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, there are a number of reasons for dilated common ducts. It could be benign, impacted stone, it could be a stricture from prior inflammation, but also you're worrying about a tumor. It could be a pancreatic cancer, it could be a common duct lesion, it could be a cholangiocarcinoma or an ampullary lesion. So not only do we look at the duct dilatation, but we look specifically where the transition is taking place. And this is a very nice example of a dilated common duct, and you see the transition in the head of the pancreas, you see the obstruction, and as I look at a few more images, you really can accentuate on the coronal views that low density mass in the head of the pancreas, the pancreatic cancer. Now this case makes a good point as well why coronals are so valuable, whether it's simple MPR or it's 3D imaging. By looking at the coronals, you're really able to see transition points. When you're looking at axial images, you can see the dilated duct and you follow it downward, but you're building a model in your head. Here it's much easier to see specifically where the transition is and what the cause is. So again, a very important thing to look at. Now sometimes with the pancreas, you may see a massively dilated duct, this is over a centimeter, and in fact you really don't see a discrete mass. When you see a duct over a centimeter, it tends to mean the patient has a central IPMN, invariably they have high grade dysplasia and this is malignancy, and this patient will get a total pancreatectomy. But very important, here's just a few more images showing you the case. Look at the size of this patient's pancreatic duct. That's never from chronic pancreatitis. Chronic pancreatitis, you're going to have a big duct, but you typically have calcifications. And a big duct might be six, seven millimeters. When you have a duct that looks like this, and here you're following it down to the ampulla, this is just a beautiful example of a central IPMN. Now you can see in this case, you also see little outpouching off the ducts, perhaps some side branch IPMNs. When you look at the tail, there's some nodularity within the duct, which means there's a carcinoma, high grade dysplasia, total pancreatectomy. So again, uh, the duct may even show you the specific tumor. Now we mentioned in terms of staging, 
One of the things we need to look at is the vascular map. And CT is very good at looking both on the arterial side and the venous side. We know to create images to look for tumor spread and encasement. We also know to look at the vascular map to define not only is the vessel patent, but is it narrowed. We also need to look for collateral pathways. We also need to look for variation. So for example, a variation of a, uh, the common hepatic arising off the SMA becomes critical. We also know to look for narrowing of the celiac, which might be due to meat and awkward ligament syndrome, which will be problematic if it's not fixed at the time of a Whipple's procedure, because invariably, when you resect with Whipple's, you take the GDA, within median ocular ligament syndrome is the collateral pathway down to the SMA, and then you end up with liver infarction. We've, we've spoken about the whole idea about looking at the vascular map in many articles going back a long period of time. And just a few simple examples here that the SMA and celiac have a common trunk. In the old days, surgeons would get angiography before they operated and did a Whipple's procedure. Now CT provides all of this information but again, it's very important that you provide these vascular maps to your surgeon. I mentioned median awkward ligament syndrome. When you look around the pancreatic head here, you seem to see a lot of vessels. And when you look at the 3D, you can see why. This patient's uh, GDA is markedly dilated. That's because the celiac was basically occluded proximally due to the median awkward ligament. And the way the patient got flow to the hepatic artery was from the SMA to a dilated GDA to the hepatic artery. So as I said before, if you were going to do a Whipple's procedure, which requires resection of the GDA, there will be no flow to the hepatic artery, and this patient would infarct the liver, which can be catastrophic, obviously. And you can see very nicely the narrowing and occlusion of the proximal celiac. Now, of course, you want to look carefully. You want to make certain that the celiac is not narrowed because of tumor infiltration. But when you look carefully, you would see in this case that it was median arcuate ligament syndrome. And there's been several good articles. Here was an article by Karen Horton a few years ago. And just to show you a very nice example, look at the patient's celiac here. You can see it's basically occluded. You can see the median arcuate ligament pushing down. Often with medial arcuate ligament, you will see that the celiac dilates within several centimeters past the area of narrowing, but that's not always the case. But you can see in this example, look at those very impressive collaterals. I've seen at times people not notice the median awkward ligament syndrome and assume the patient has vessel encasement and vessel involvement at surgery because they say, oh boy, look at all these collaterals. But these are the collaterals that are seen around the pancreatic head often, nicely shown here, in patients with median awkward ligament syndrome. Now, it's just not only in pancreatic cancer. Median awkward ligament syndrome or compression is critical in potential liver transplant patients, patients with planned extensive hepatic resection where GDA patency is critical, or patients with planned Whipple's procedure. And just to show you, again, think about this. This is why the sagittal view was so important. You may not recognize it axially. Sagittal is very easy to see. Now, sagittal, beyond looking at normal variations, is a very nice way of looking at vessel encasement. Here's a nice example of encasement of the patient's SMA, really nicely shown on the sagittal, as well as the coronal on both the MIP and on the sagittal imaging, very nicely shown. Another example here, you can see the SMA is patent but narrowed proximally, and tumor infiltrates the vessel. This patient would be unresectable. Or this example with more extensive tumor where there's encasement of both the celiac and SMA. Now, in this case, the patient has lots of tumor. It's growing around the aorta. It's involving the left kidney. There's liver metastasis. This is not very much of a subtle case. But I thought I'd show you a spectrum where sometimes the only involvement will be the vessels. Other times, you'll see much more extensive involvement. Patients like this with liver mets, Liver mets are the one thing we will say this patient is unresectable. Though I will admit that there are new studies going on looking at resecting solitary liver metastasis. Till a year ago, it was felt to be, you had liver mets, forget about it. Now you have a liver met or two and you're stable post chemotherapy. Uh, the consideration is perhaps treat this like a colon cancer patient, perhaps treat this like a hepatoma patient with isolated disease and go in and resect. And again, that's something that's 
controversial. That's something that's going to be a work in progress, and we'll see if this indeed helps. Now, again, this whole idea about vascular resectability, as I mentioned, angiography was done in the past. CT is the way to go. You can see articles going back for probably 10 or 15 years have spoken about this. And once we went to 64 slice CT, multiphasic isotropic CT of the abdomen and use of reformations helps in determining the exact site and extent of both arterial and venous invasion. And just to share a few simple examples, this patient obviously has liver metastasis, but look at the patient's tumor in the head of the pancreas. You can see the portal vein, SMV, splenic vein confluence is encased and occluded. And as I look at the MIP images, you can see very nicely the multiple collaterals. And again, a combination of volume rendering and MIP works very nicely in this scenario. Now, this is a very extensive involvement. Th this patient will never become a candidate for resection. We talk about a pancreatic conference, borderline resectable. When there's vessel occlusion of this extent, you'll give chemotherapy, but literally when you speak to the patient, you really have to tell them that the chance of them ever being a surgical candidate is about zero. On the other hand, this patient, where the splenic vein occlusion, you see the mass, and you can see subtle involvement of the portal vein, with chemotherapy, potentially, this patient may become resectable. You can see when I look at the images, particularly the coronal, look how nicely you can see the tumor, the splenic vein occlusion, and this bite, you might call it, of the patient's portal vein. And again, this patient is unresectable at this time, and this patient may never become resectable, but in some patients, uh, the tumor regresses. In some patients, the tumor stabilizes, and the surgeons will aggressively resect a portion of the portal vein with the splenic vein and a distal pancreatectomy. But again, it depends how the patient performs when the patient gets chemotherapy. And you can see this very nicely in these additional examples as well. And I'll just show you a few more pictures of that. Again, this also shows the value of coronal and 3D imaging in really helping you create one or two pictures which gives the information from 1,100 to 1,200 slices. Another example of portal vein invasion, here's a mass net of the pancreas. Portal vein is narrowed. You can see there's some invasion of the portal vein. The portal vein is still patent. And again, this will be a patient who, it's going to be hard, will this patient ever become resectable? But in a patient like this, where there's just some involvement of the portal vein, indeed, it's going to become possible. But it all depends on how the patient responds to chemotherapy. And you can see very nicely in this example here, the patient's involvement of the SMV, very nicely shown in the coronal views. And here's just one more picture of that. So again, very, very nice example of tumor infiltration. Now, as tumors get more extensive, you can see there's a larger tumor. Patient has liver lesions. You can see this patient even has a stent placed in the duodenum as a way of keeping the duodenum open. You can see the collateral pathways. When you do get portal vein and splenic vein and SMV involvement, you can get very impressive collaterals. I find that showing this to the surgeon with MIP imaging makes it easier. MIP is sort of a global presentation. It doesn't show you exactly each vessel orientation, but it really gives you a big picture look. And in this case, obviously, the big picture really shows extensive spread of disease. Now, when we also evaluate patients, we look for adjacent organ involvement. The most common uh, organ involved will be the duodenum. Remember, with pancreatic head tumors, the duodenum is not uncommonly involved, particularly second and third portion. But in terms of making the patient unresectable, it's not going to be an issue because with the Whipple's procedure, you resect the duodenum anyway. The same thing with the spleen. The spleen is not uncommonly involved in patients with distal pancreatectomies or distal tumors in the tail of the pancreas. But again, it's not going to matter because patients with distal pancreatectomies are getting splenectomy. So splenic involvement does not necessarily mean you're unresectable. When you have involvement of the kidney or involvement of the transverse colon or stomach, then it's going to be less likely that you will be resectable. Occasionally, a very short segment of stomach can be resected. But once you're talking about kidney and colon, realistically, this patient has extensive spread of disease. Here's a nice example of a patient with a large mass body and tail of pancreas, which is growing posteriorly and casing the patient's left renal artery and vein. You can see the tumor is going posteriorly 
These are the patients often who present with back pain as well. Whenever I see tumor extending posteriorly surrounding the aorta, I know the patient is going to be unresectable, but it's also a patient who probably will benefit from the pain center. And they'll do celiac blocks in these patients, and that will often reduce a lot of their symptoms. You can see also in this case the tumor infiltration goes beyond the pancreas, beyond the kidneys, and also involves the duodenum. So we've seen some cases where presentation is gastric outlet obstruction and you follow the transition and then a ligament of trites, the patient's uh, duodenum is obstructed. Sometimes it simulates a gastric outlet obstruction by a gastric cancer. Sometimes it simulates a duodenal tumor, but it may be simply a carcinoma of the tail of the pancreas. And you can see this very nicely in this next set of images. You see the dilated small bowel to the ligament of trites, and then you see tumor. Now, when you look quickly, it does almost look like a duodenal cancer or cancer in the proximal jejunum. But then when you look at all of the images, you can see the involvement of the duodenum, involvement of the jejunum, the involvement of the splenic vein, portal vein, and really it's a pancreatic carcinoma of the tail of the pancreas, unresectable. These patients will sometimes get radiation therapy to try to relieve symptoms. I showed you an example where stents are being placed not uncommonly. Another example, direct extension into the spleen. This case also appears to involve or comes close to involving the left kidney, but as I mentioned, splenic involvement alone will not make someone unresectable if the lesion is very extensive, like here, and involves the kidney, and involves the stomach. Well, then it's just not going to happen, right? You're not going to be able to do resectability. Now, in terms of errors, what errors do we make? It's interesting, if you go back to this article from 2002, so that's about 13 years ago, the same errors, forget the percent, we have a much better predictive value today in the 90% plus range, but our biggest challenge is still a liver metastasis. Small lesions on the surface measuring a couple millimeters are still hard to see. Sometimes people will get laparoscopic uh, looks before they get operated on. We don't do this at Hopkins, some institutions do. Vascular encasement, they made mistakes. Well, usually we're pretty good about that, but it can be a source of error, and adenopathy. When you do a Whipple's procedure or a distal pancreatectomy or a body resection, you always need to collect uh, nodes, usually 25 to 30 nodes, and that's really a pathologic diagnosis. If you see bulky nodes, 1.5 centimeters or greater, invariably they're going to be infiltrated by tumor. But often when the surgeon collects nodes and they measure 2 to 5 millimeters, they still can be positive. Patients with positive nodes and negative margins uh, still have a problem with like chemotherapy. I saw a patient recently who had a tumor that was 2 centimeters, perfectly clear margins, perfectly resectable, and had like 9 positive nodes. And the nodes were all in the 5 millimeters. So CT is not going to be something that we use for nodes. There were articles, does nodal involvement or suspected nodal involvement uh, make a patient unresectable? The answer is no. Sometimes you see larger nodes that are inflammatory. So no one is not going to operate because of the presence of nodes, but you need to sample nodes, and a minimum of 20 nodes is a good surgery. Now I mentioned about the multidisciplinary approach. Here's another article. Again, the point being this article uh, by Foley, or this article uh, by Rahman, again, talks about the importance of thinking about the entire process and making sure that we're doing the best treatment for the patient. Sometimes the best treatment is surgery, and sometimes the best treatment is to avoid surgery. And every single patient needs to be treated as an individual patient, and that's really where a multidisciplinary conference steps in. Now, one of the things we've learned in multidisciplinary conference are a few pitfalls. So one thing is that once patients get neoadjuvant combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and you follow the patient's scans, there's a great tendency to overestimate the disease present because the tissue planes are not as sharp. So simply seeing thickening and some increased soft tissue density is really not enough to assume the patient is unresectable. In that article by Kim, they make that point very nicely. In this article by Morgan, sensitivity for prediction of resectability tends to be lower for patients with advanced pancreatic cancer that have been downgraded by neoadjuvant therapy. That same principle. Again, you need to be very careful. In our experience, if the patient is borderline, the patient will indeed get surgery. So again, you really want to be very careful 
that you do not deny patients the option of a surgical cure by overestimating the degree of vascular involvement on CT, particularly after therapy. So that becomes very important. Now, one of the things I've seen also with multidisciplinary conference, and I think I'll end with this topic, is on what I would call misdiagnosis. So sometimes patients are sent to us for pancreatic cancer, and they don't have pancreatic cancer. They have a prominent pancreas, or sometimes they have a duodenal mass, and I've seen duodenal masses be called pancreatic cancer, typically just tumors. Sometimes they have nodes in the peripancreatic region, and it spreads from a right colon cancer, or potentially it's lymphoma. Another thing that we never heard about a few years back is autoimmune pancreatitis, which goes by a number of different names. Autoimmune pancreatitis is, I would say, one of the great mimickers. If you go back to large surgical series, every big center always had a few cases a year of patients who were having Whipple's procedure for pancreatic cancer and ended up with autoimmune pancreatitis. Well, what is it? It's a type of chronic pancreatitis that is characterized by an autoimmune inflammatory process associated with fibrosis of the pancreas. The key findings are the classic history of pancreatitis previously doesn't exist. The big thing, of course, is elevated IG4, which allows a dramatic response to thyroid the steroid therapy. What's interesting about autoimmune pancreatitis is its presentation. Its presentation really simulates pancreatic cancer. Men more than women, usually patients over age 50, but look at presentation, jaundice, abdominal pain, weight loss, diabetes. Wow, this sounds like what I told you on the second slide on pancreatic cancer. Now, often it's associated with other immune processes from sclerosing cholangitis and primary biliary cirrhosis to IBD to renal involvement to retroperitoneal fibrosis. But again, think about this. Weight loss, no good history of pancreatitis, CA-199 may be elevated, and on CT, it looks like a mass. Now, we have learned that things tend to be different with autoimmune pancreatitis in most cases. You see diffuse glandular enlargement, but there's a loss of the lobular texture, what's called a featureless gland. And although you may see iso hypo attenuating zones, you often see that with a non-dilated pancreatic duct. Well, you would expect if this was really a pancreatic mass, you would see a big common duct and a big pancreatic duct, as I typically have shown you. And sometimes we talk about a cigar appearance or a halo appearance around the gland. So here's a patient who was sent to us for pancreatic cancer. When you look carefully, there is enlargement of the distal body and tail, but notice that halo around the gland. And oh yes, that lesion in the liver is hemangioma, but there's a halo around the gland. Or in this case, same thing. Look at the gland. It looks enlarged, but when you see pancreatic cancer, you usually see a dilated duct, and it's that halo around the gland. When you start doing coronals or you do off-plane axials, you see how the gland is diffusely enlarged, but it doesn't have the look of pancreatic cancer. Pancreatic cancer is hypodense, but it's discrete hypodense. Here you see diffuse enlargement, and it's just this mottled appearance. It's this lack of features. Now, if you want to see a great example, this patient presents with jaundice and weight loss, and it looks like a pancreatic mass, but again, when you look carefully, both in body and head and tail, it just doesn't look right. Why don't I see a dilated duct? I always see a dilated pancreatic duct when there's a tumor, and then when you look carefully, okay, you say, well, are you sure it's not a tumor? Well, with a patient, when you think about autoimmune pancreatitis, if you treat the patient, you draw IgG4 levels, and that could be a home run diagnosis. But what you do is you're only wasting a couple weeks because if you treated this patient with steroid therapy, look what happens within two weeks. Look at the size of the gland. Okay, you see now how the gland is shrunken? So the way you treat autoimmune pancreatitis is 40 milligrams of prednisone for two weeks. And you can see here's side-by-side -side comparison. This patient would have gotten a Whipple's procedure or possibly a total pancreatectomy, and yet the patient needed nothing. So it's important to think in your mind about autoimmune pancreatitis. It's not the most common diagnosis, but it's not uncommon. And I would say at Hopkins, we see five to 10 cases a year. So that's not a trivial amount. Now, just a last point to mention, where else do I see things going in terms of pancreatic imaging? We're looking at perfusion CT as well as CT texture mapping. Can we define the tumor and define its aggressiveness? Will dual energy CT help? It may help not only in 
lesion characterization in terms of what responds to the chemotherapy, but when response is taking place. And again, there's some interest in PET-CT, both in terms of looking for distant metastasis, but looking at response. This whole idea about tumor angiogenesis becomes so important, and that's why perfusion is emerging as a potentially important technique, and perhaps it will help us within pancreatic cancer, looking at things like alterations of blood flow, blood volume, and permeability. But again, this is something that is coming along and is not yet ready for prime time. And perfusion CT, particularly with newer low dose scanners, is something that I think you will see evolving over the next couple years. So it may become an important tool. PET CT, again, um, lots of different uh, experiences. Only about th up to two thirds to three quarters of CT adenocarcinomas will be positive on PET. But can you use that as a way of predicting response? Uh, what happens if there's no increased activity in a patient's tumor that had increased activity? Does that mean the patient has no viable tumor and the patient will become resectable? It's not really clear. But as this article by Ramon makes the point, PET-CT has gradually become an accepted part of the imaging algorithm for patients with pancreatic cancer. It's not clear where it's going to fit in, but I think perhaps it will fit in. The same thing with MR. CT still is the study of choice for evaluation of pancreatic cancer, as long as the patient can get IV contrast. But I think a lot of interest in what else is going to happen. How can we do things better? So concluding then, when you think about pancreatic cancer, CT is ideal, widely available. It's easy to execute quality studies with specific protocols. I mentioned that article about how to do the studies, dual phase imaging, the importance of post-processing, the ability to have second opinions very easily with CT works very nicely. Again, pancreatic cancer is a dismal disease. Despite lots of effort, it's still killing about 40,000 patients each year in the United States. Uh, hopefully, we will do better. There's some new chemotherapy coming along and being introduced, the combination of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, and the importance that the radiologist plays in accurately staging and triaging patients. And with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention.